Merry Christmas, BG4. The week is here, and I'm grateful that you would take some time to reflect with me on the real meaning of Christmas as we go into these days that can be so busy and sometimes harried. We are continuing to reflect on what the light of Christmas means in each of our lives. I want to give you a couple of invitations. We are having our Christmas candlelight service at 5.30 and 7 p.m. on the 23rd. So if you're watching this, there still may be time to come join us. And when you watch in person, you get to see our adorable kids and their nativity and hear the incredible music. So I hope you can join us. We have a fireworks stand this week. And also, just for those who are regulars, um, if you want to um, have your giving be recorded for 2021. Could you have that postmarked by December 31st or online or by text so that we can properly uh, give you the tax credit that you might be looking for for the year? Thank you to everyone in advance who's given and been with us throughout this year. Well, this morning, I want to talk about surprises. 
When I was 14 years old, my family had this unusual experience. My dad was the superintendent of our small mountain school district, and through some crazy circumstances, he made a connection and he invited this Soviet expat ballet dancer to come teach summer school to country kids. And so Sergei Kozadayev moved into our family home. He brought his two teenage boys who were around my age, and during the day, he taught us ballet and drama, most basic, of course because most of us had no background. And then after school, he taught us how to fish and forage like we were real Russians. It was a magical summer for my sister and I, full of all kinds of great kid fun. Well, we came to our final performance. It was set to happen in the school multi-purpose room. I bet you know what that looks like. Not the most aesthetically beautiful environment. And in that environment, we were going to perform um, things he had taught us, but we also asked him to dance. Well, the music came on and Sergei just began to literally float and leap across the stage. Our, our jaws were on the floor. It was so phenomenal and superhuman and beautiful. In his climactic leaps, he literally touched his feet together 16 times. I verified my source on that. I didn't even know that was possible. And suddenly we realized the level of ballet master that we had been learning from over the summer. We learned that he was a peer of Mikhail Baryshnikov and had danced in the most premier ballet um, companies in Russia. And then he taught summer school to a bunch of kids who had no idea what they were doing. I'd been in the presence of greatness in my own school cafeteria, the most ordinary of circumstances. So I'm wondering if you've had an experience like that where you uh, got to see something that was great, that was beautiful, and it was surprising because it was surrounded by the ordinary. Maybe you went for a hike and you saw just the most spectacular sunset over, just the, over a desert. Or maybe it's talking to a child, a grandchild, someone like that, and they just give you a pearl of wisdom. I recently learned about a family in our church who gave a vehicle to another family in need. It was beautiful and unexpected, and it came out of just ordinary circumstances. Two early followers of Jesus from different backgrounds give us the scriptures we're going to read today. Both had seen what Jesus was truly capable of. They glimpsed his glory, just his, his real worth, his reputation, his value. And they were able to look back at the ordinary circumstances of his birth with unusual perspectives. Both Luke and John give us biographical information about Jesus, but also reflections on this rabbi Jesus who changed the course of history and changed both of their lives. So let's read together. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus, I'm switching to Luke's version, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all returned to their ancestral homes to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee and took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth, and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available to them. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Those are some of the most beautiful and mysterious words in the entire Bible. The word became human and made his 
home among us. John is giving us behind the scenes information. It's kind of like Jesus' CV or his resume. And he's telling us that Jesus is the meaning of the story. He's the climax. The Hebrews use the word logos to refer to God's authoritative word. And when God speaks, he creates what doesn't exist according to his intentions. And the Greeks used this word logos to describe the reason or the logic behind the universe. The Stoics were famous for talking about the logos of the universe. And John, when he writes about who Jesus was before he came to earth, he draws from both those traditions to say that Jesus is the meaning of life and the story of history. He's the climax. Because he could look backwards, having seen who Jesus was, and recognize that history flowed inevitably to this climactic moment when the creator steps into his own handiwork. Or it's like a playwright who writes this incredible play, and then he writes himself in and steps into the action. This is the most important part of the story, the personal rescue mission of God. And as a careful historian, Luke brings his perspective, which is to record some important historical facts. Caesar Augustus gave the word. Caesar, the Caesars in Rome, took a census of their always expanding empire approximately every 14 years. They did it because they wanted to make sure they weren't missing out on taxes. And so around AD 6, Joseph of Nazareth and his fiancée Mary were recalled to their ancestral home where their families were from. They had emigrated to southern Galilee, but they had to travel back to Bethlehem because Joseph owned property there. And he had to register because the empire wanted him to pay property taxes. And so Caesar gave this word in far off Rome, and these poor people in the Middle East had to scramble and reorganize their entire lives to do what he said. But there's more than meets the eye to this story because Luke is telling us that ultimately it was God that gave the word. Luke says, while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. Been nine months since an angel told Mary she was going to give birth to Messiah, whose father was God. But when we talk about the time had come, we're also talking about Jewish salvation history, that this was the moment that everyone had been waiting for when God was going to take action to personally rescue his people. Without even realizing it, Caesar Augustus, who was the most powerful man in the world at the time, was a pawn in the hands of God. He used Caesar to get Mary and Joseph in the right place at the right time to fulfill his ultimate word that it was time for that rescue. And so he slipped quietly into his own creation. How many of us have experienced Feeling like you were collateral damage in somebody else's decision. You live with the consequences of other people's decisions. Maybe it's decisions that happen in Washington, D.C. or in Olympia. Or maybe it's decisions of people in your home and you've been dealing with the consequences. What is incredibly encouraging to me about the Christmas story is no matter where my words find you tonight, and if you feel like you're dealing with the consequences of others' decisions, God can still be at work at a deeper level in your story, bringing rescue and bringing redemption because he's the light in the darkness. John 1, when he says he's the light, that echoes Genesis 1 where God said he looked at the darkness and the chaos and he said, let there be light. And that light jumped into existence and continued to send waves out into the whole universe. And again, because of sin, because of rebellion, because we, are, we break our own hearts and we break God's heart. God's world, his beloved creation was filled with darkness. And again, he said, let there be light as he sent his son. And Luke tells us how that happened. God gave his son to be born in a manger. Think about it. Jesus was born under a conquering Roman army. He knew poverty. He knew oppression. He didn't have any special privileges. He knew the dark side of being human. And Mary 
was the one, first one to welcome him, this humble teenager who welcomed God into her own body, her own womb, and then gave birth to a vulnerable baby. And God allowed himself to come into his creation, needing to depend on others, so vulnerable, able to be so easily crushed like a small candlelight with the darkness all around. And yet the world would never, ever be the same. The light transforms the darkness. Because God had entered the world, the darkness would never be the same. On that first night, it was just Mary and Joseph and these shepherds who were really at the out, they were really outcasts at the margin of society, who gathered around a manger and noticed this tiny, vulnerable light that God had sent into the world. And yet that light would send waves out until it filled the entire universe. John says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. That word extinguish is kataleban, which is a word that is like, it's violent. It's for an evil attack. And I, I think that John may have used that word because he knew that the Roman Empire would try to crush Jesus and crush his followers and his movement. But yet John also saw that darkness never has the advantage, no matter how small the light is, because darkness has no creative power. And so ultimately the darkness must retreat in the face of this little light right there in Bethlehem because this light was the love that begins our story. Notice that John's story starts with love. He uses this phrase, the word was with God. It's a powerful little word. That word for with means equal face-to-face -face relationship, an intimate relationship. And so He's not talking about a universal intelligence behind life. He's talking about God the Son, an eternal loving relationship with God the Father and God the Spirit. And I want you to notice that whether you come from a loving family or, or your family's broken or you never ever knew your parents or where you are from, your story begins with a loving God. And it's out of that love that he creates and redeems. God let us know him. The word became human and lived among us. Literally, he put up a tent. Isn't that just a beautiful picture of Jesus slipping into the neighborhood, willing to sleep on a futon, putting up a tent, coming in unremarkable and unnoticed so that we could know him? What is God really like? Look at Jesus. What God looks like when he encounters people, what God sounds like when he speaks to us, what it feels like to have God put his hand on your shoulder and how God loves us. Maybe like me, you have called yourself a Christian for a long time, or maybe you're new to this Jesus in church stuff. Either way, I think it's true that sometimes when we're under pressure, our true beliefs about God come out. Recently, I experienced that. We've gone through really what has been a difficult year for our family, full of pressure. And I imagine many of you have experienced the same. In the last year, my husband had this um, major stroke. And then we didn't realize how with a medical emergency, there's just so much time and so much effort that's put into recovery, that's put to finding your new normal. And of course, on top of that, we had the regular stress of living through a pandemic. Anybody else experienced that? And you find yourself pretty tired and maybe not handling things as well. And on the tail end of all of this, we had a month in our family business where sales were really low. And didn't really think much of it the first month, but the second month the same, and it started to look like a trend. And it was about that time that a normal person should have said, well, this is probably a normal after effect of a pandemic on our industry, and we need to calmly wait it out. But for some reason, I couldn't stop thinking, working, thinking about work, and trying to figure it out. And I found myself wondering, maybe this is the time when the bottom drops out and I'm, I'm not able to solve this. I'm not able to help my family. And after some sleepless nights and some extra emotion, I took some time to pull away and reflect on what was going on in my own soul. And where was God in all of this? 
And I recognized that I was actually picturing the situation. Like I was in this arena, it was dark. There was all this stuff coming at me and I was struggling. And God was somewhere on the sidelines watching to see if I would succeed or fail. Now, many of us may have had a parent or a coach who was pretty distant, but somehow we occasionally impose our beliefs, our experiences on God. I wonder if I'm the only one who's ever had this kind of experience. I was thinking that my challenges of the year confirmed this feeling of abandonment and I lost sight of who God really is. And then my thoughts were drawn back to Jesus. John says he was full of grace and truth, full of unfailing love and faithfulness. Many of us have experienced a harsh critic. Maybe it was a coach, maybe it was a parent, maybe it's the friend that you can never do enough for. But that's not who God is because Jesus is full of unfailing love. Some of us have experienced someone leaving us holding the bag, someone who was supposed to fulfill their side of the deal, who said they would walk with us, but they didn't. But Jesus is full of faithfulness. He always keeps his word. What is God really like? Look to Jesus. John tells us we have seen his glory. This glory is his true value and worth. And you might be wondering, when did we, when would John say he saw, he had that glimpse of his glory? It's kind of like when I was in my middle school cafeteria and I saw who Sergei Kozadayev really was. Was it when Jesus was teaching or healing people? Well, that certainly revealed some of who he was. But John's clear in telling us that the moment when God's glory was most fully revealed was when Jesus hung on a Roman cross out of love for you and me, God's personal rescue mission. And because of that, we reflect back on the years of waiting and we reflect back on the quiet birth of Bethlehem and we can see the true meaning that God has come to the rescue. Your story up to this point might include struggle. It might include failure, but that is not the whole story. The truest story is that Jesus stepped out of heaven where there is no night, no darkness, and he stepped into your darkness, into my darkness, to transform it and light it forever. Jesus was not content to shout directions from the sidelines and watch to see if you succeed or fail. He dove in to be with you in your darkest moments. This Christmas, we celebrate the true story of his rescue, the love that never gives up. And we want to receive this vulnerable and powerful light. And so if you have a candle at home, I'd encourage you to grab it and light it and reflect on what it meant for God to come as this vulnerable light and transform the world and our lives forever. Can I pray for you? Lord, thank you for the light of Christmas. It's not an overpowering light. It's not a cold and distant star that we're supposed to wish on. It's a personal searchlight because Lord, you came to the rescue. You didn't send someone else. So for anyone that's listening to me that does not have a personal relationship with Jesus, now is a moment to say, yes, yes, I want to be found. I want to be rescued. I want to surrender to Jesus. And for those of us who are just reflecting on the meaning of Christmas, I pray that we would be reminded that you are the God who's with us, that you are the God who lights up our night and never leaves us on our own. And we'd set aside our false ideas of you and receive your light this Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you uh, perhaps on December 26th and also as we start our new year. Thank you for joining us online and Merry Christmas. Thank you.